everybody, it's Aiden here once again with another new series. Well, I say a series, I mean more of a, I don't know, a mini-series. This is a driving academy series, but I don't want to use the term academy because it makes it sound more important than I actually am. We'll just call it a sim racing driving school. But then again, story time never really had a name and look how that turned out. Let's just go with the flow. Rambling over, this series hopes to make your lap times fall and your consistency go up. Now, obviously, I can't guarantee that since I don't have all the answers, nor am I the world's best driver. But hopefully, you'll learn something, find it interesting, or just get a little bit of a refresher as it's good to get those from time to time. You know, like when your teachers went on courses, so they could learn more and refresh their memories and stuff, and you got a supply teacher you could have fun with. I say have fun with. Abuse. You may even discover that you've been doing this all the time without even thinking about it, and this series might make you understand why you do these things. So in this first episode of... I don't know how many, it depends on what you want, we're going to look at one of the absolute fundamentals of circuit driving. The racing line. Yes, 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 I know. Empty Box has already done something like this, and so has Chris Hay. But I'm having a go. Maybe I'll cover something they didn't, or maybe you don't watch them, maybe you can't stand their voices. What's going on guys? This is Empty Box. Yeah, I sound like Ray Romano, what about it? But before we can start trying to bomb it around the track as fast as we possibly can, we need to know the sort of corners we're going to tackle over the course of a lap. We can all drive very, very fast in a straight line, but what about all these sudden changes of direction? So what is a racing line? We've all heard our favourite motorsports commentators bang on about it, but what does it actually achieve? Well, put simply, the racing line, the ideal line, the driving line, the groove, whatever you want to call it, is the fastest route through any particular corner. Now notice how I said fastest and not best route, since at some tracks there can be a million different lines through a particular corner, but only one of them will give you the best returns on lap time. Yeah, turn one at Daytona. I'm looking at you. In this example, I'm driving the Chevrolet Corvette in a circle at around 30 miles an hour, and it's keeping a very tight circle. Now watch what happens as I apply more gas. The circle gets bigger, and the keen-eyed amongst you will notice that I've not changed my steering input. The faster I go, the larger that radius gets, and it's all a pretty linear thing if you were to put it on some sort of chart or graph or whatever. As speed goes up, so does radius. This is why small radius corners are slow and longer ones are fast. Who'd have thought? So, what do you think I need to do to get round a tightish corner as fast as I can? Correct! I've got to make the radius of that corner as large as possible, with some caveats which we'll get to in a minute. This is why Curva Grande at Monza is taken flat out in pretty much all modern racing cars, while well, something like Istanbul's Turn 8 cars need to lift out of, because Curva Grande's radius, by comparison, is huge. So let's boil this whole racing line malarkey down into the very basics first by looking at a simple 90 degree right-hander. Well, 90 degrees-ish. The most basic of corners has the most basic of approaches. Racing lines in this case can be looked at geometrically. Now I've split this corner, which is turn 1 at the red ball ring, in half at 45 degrees. Now just for the sake of argument, let's say we braked at the first yellow line, turned in, clipped the apex at the second yellow line, and got out of the corner on the power at the third yellow line. This is all simple stuff, you yeah, know, we can do it all with our eyes shut. Taking the geometric racing line does have some advantages, such as maintaining momentum, which is useful for cars that don't have a lot of power, it maximises the cornering radius in the most efficient way, and it's good for your tyres. But it's not often the best way to get through the corner in terms of absolute speed for a good lap time. It is, however, a good way of getting used to going inside to outside. Now I've overlaid two lines onto this corner, the geometric line and the shortest line. Look at the differences in radii. The green line, which is the geometric one, is going to give you better overall speed as the radius is much larger compared to the shorter line in red. Going back to the Corvette example, I was able to take the wider arc at higher speed. Here I am trying to go through Turn 1 at Bathurst, a 90 degree left-hander by taking the shortest possible route. 
Now watch as I take the ideal geometric racing line. Now the apex speed with the shortest line was 55, with the in inverted commas proper line taken at 100. And on the exit and apex of this corner, and even on the entry in some cases, there are these things called curbs, and we can use these to our advantage. Curbs, spelled C-U-R-B-S or K-E-R-B-S depending on where you live, or often called rumble strips or ripple strips, are flat curb stones on the exits of almost every corner on every racetrack on the planet. There are two reasons for this. One is that single seat racing cars can be quite difficult to see out of and they are there as a safety thing to stop cars being dropped onto the grass on the exit of a corner and serve as a warning and visual aid, hence the reason they often painted red and white. If they weren't there, drivers would drive through the dirt on the inside and outside of the corner to increase the radius of the turn as much as possible, and over time it would create a rut, break away the edge of the pavement and increase maintenance costs, and also cause a catastrophic accident if it gets too bad. So they build these curbs in the area where the drivers place their car's tyres. And originally, curbs used to be designed similar to the ones you see outside your house on the pavement, but in the mid-1990s the FIA standardised curb heights in response to Rubens Barrichello's smash at Imola in 1994. Since then, drivers have treated them as part of the track, using as much as they can get away with to increase the radius of a turn. Now this, along with this new fangled idea that tarmac runoff is better than gravel, has led to the FIA finding new ways to try and curb, no pun intended, drivers' enthusiasm, such as installing the so-called sausage curbs on the insides and outsides of some corners to upset the cars driving over them. And these have come under scrutiny in recent years as Konstantin Tereshenko and Sofia Florsch have both been launched into the air by them. And in that first example, I oversimplified it, deliberately, you know, for people who are brand new to this. So apologies if you are a seasoned veteran speaking almost exclusively via adenoids thinking, oh no, it is compromised of this and that and the other, so oh, please do your research. So having looked at a simple corner, we're going to look at something where a different, sort of a non-geometric line, is going to be more useful. Here is the Melbourne hairpin at Donington Park. We need to get from point A, the braking zone, to point C, the exit, via B, the apex, as quickly as possible. It's easy to assume then that the fastest way to get from point A to point C is to hug the inside line because that's what you've seen Mo Farrow do in the 5,000 metres at the Olympics, and you know he does that because that's the shortest route. You'd be right. It is the shortest route, but again, not the fastest. It is on a 400 metre athletics track because it has a 100 metre radius on the inside, but this corner, well, it clearly doesn't. And I also apologise profusely for my awful MS Paint skills here, but I hope you're getting the gist of what I'm getting at. You might be thinking that the full inside line for shortest distance would be okay, because it's such a slow corner anyway, why does it matter? But we need to maximise speed as a whole, not just for one small portion of the track. Now I've exaggerated point A on this diagram, so we'll just assume the car that we're in has got brakes more powerful than Thanos, and this is our starting point for our journey through this particular corner. We want to start on the outside, brake at point A, turn in at the yellow line, Clip the apex, apply the power, and straighten up the steering on the way out using that exit curbing if necessary. And this is that caveat that I was on about before. I know what you're thinking. For a 180 degree hairpin, that line doesn't look particularly symmetrical, and the apex isn't at the midpoint of the corner like it was in the last one, and you'd be right. What we've done here is sacrificed entry speed at the yellow line for a better exit. This is called the late apex. The straight following this hairpin is relatively short, but if we were to use a better example such as La Source at Spa or Turn 11 at Austin, getting on the power early means we'll be at a much higher speed by the time we reach the next braking zone. Yeah, you'll have travelled a few extra feet, but the pros outweigh the cons here. Remember, distance is irrelevant, we just need to keep the speed up as much as possible. Plus, the car will be straighter when you're on the power, meaning you can get on not just earlier, but harder. And this technique isn't exclusive to hairpins or slow corners, even our original 90 degree right-hander can have late apexes taken. And this is really good in high-powered cars or on qualifying runs or hump laps. All that said, we'll look at a final example before seeing these lines taken in practice. This final example is the farm section at Silverstone. Two tight corners in succession. And here, 
we've got several options we can take to daisy chain these two corners together. Option one is geometric at the right-hander and geometric at the second to sail on our tyres. Or we can take the geometric apex and late apex to allow for maximum top speed on the Wennington straight. Or even late apex and late apex which makes it easier to open up the second part of this complex. Whichever line you decide to take will be down to the car you're in, your setup and whatever you feel comfortable doing. Try them out, see what works best for each occasion. And by doing so, you'll learn the limits of the car and how it responds in various types of driving scenarios. Such corners, such as Brooklyn's at Silverstone or most of the corners at Brands Hatch, have naturally late apexes, and Hell Corner and Murray's at Bathurst are fastest, in my experience, when taken geometrically. There is no perfect line for every corner, only what makes you go fastest with your driving style, the setup, the conditions, and obviously how much grip your car has. So instead of a simple A, B, C in brake, apex, gas, we've now got A, B, C, D, and E. Brake, turn, apex, straight and power. Now obviously if you drive a Tesla, a corner only ever has two parts. One, take selfie. Two, send to Instagram. But there are actually eight parts to a corner, some of which you'll be doing without even thinking about it. You've got the approach, where you'll be at the fastest point of straight line travel. The pedal transition, which is the split second between coming off the throttle and onto the brakes. You've got the braking zone itself, where you'll transition weight onto the front axle to help you generate some more initial turning grip. The gear changes, with heel-toe braking, which may be a later episode, to keep the weight balance in check in manual cars. Then you've got the turn-in, the balancing of the throttle to put the weight back onto the rear wheels, which will aid traction, the apex, and post-apex acceleration, where you begin to unwind the steering and apply max throttle, where applicable, obviously. So how does this look in a sim on a real track? Well, I'm glad you asked, and I'm going to take a couple of cars to some racetracks around the world and show you. So thank you very much for watching, I hope this has helped you in your quest to start knocking off those precious few tents. Obviously I'm not the best nor the fastest but this stuff works for me and I don't want my parents to think that my teaching degree has been totally wasted. If you have any questions or other tips, leave them in the comments and the best tips I will pin. So if this has been useful, please give this video a like so I know I've not wasted my time. And if you want to see more sim racing and real world racing content, click the subscribe button. I'll also leave a link to my Discord server, and if you think my work is deserving of a donation, I'll also leave a link to my Patreon. So until next time, I've been Ada Millward, and goodbye.